Hello, I'm Tracy Sulkin. As the Dean of the University of Illinois College of Media, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to discourse on the film and media industries at the 2020 Ebert Symposium series. Welcome to the third Ebert Symposium at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign at the College of Media. Tonight, we're going to talk about the future of the movie industry and we've invited some illustrious guests to join us. In alphabetical order, the filmmakers are Melissa Hazlip. She's an award-winning filmmaker based in New York. Her work responds to pressing social issues at the intersection of racial justice, social justice, activism, and representation. Melissa's film, Mr. Soul, won Best Music Documentary at the International Documentary Association Awards is currently streaming. Thanks for having me. Our next panelist is Malcolm D. Lee. He's a director, writer, and producer. Malcolm Lee made history in July 2017 as the director and producer of Girls Trip, the first film with the full African-American creative team in front of and behind the camera to surpass the $100 million mark at the box office, grossing over $140 million worldwide. Lee's other credits include The Best Man, The Best Man Holiday, Undercover Brother, and Night School. He's currently in post on Space Jam, a new legacy with LeBron James. His blackmailed productions have several projects in active development, including I Almost Forgot About You, an adaptation of Terry McMillan's novel with Viola Davis, Double Dutch, and Real Talk, all with Universal. He has Rock the Bells with Fox and The Spoils with Liongate. Hello, nice to be here. Mary Mazio is an Olympic athlete, a recovering lawyer, and an award-winning filmmaker that focuses on social impact. Her last film, Underwater Dreams, raised over $100 million with the Obama White House for STEM initiatives for Latinx students. Her film, I Am Jane Doe, catalyzed bipartisan legislation signed last year around the topic of online responsibility. And her newest film, a most beautiful thing just out is so very resonant and timely. Delighted to be here, Chess. Christine Swanson has written and or directed numerous award-winning feature films, television episodes, commercials, and short films in her career. She is a Detroit native and a visionary storyteller. She's a multiple award-winning filmmaker and is the director of the smash hit movie, The Clark Sisters. Thank you for having me, Chaz and Nate Cohen. Michael Barker is co-president and co-founder of Sony Pictures Classics with Tom Bernard, which has distributed and often produced some of the finest independent movies over the past 30 years. Barker's films have received 159 Academy Award nominations and 36 wins. Great to be with you here again, Chaz and Nate. Neil Block is head of distribution and marketing for Magnolia Pictures. Over his 15 year tenure at the company, he has overseen the releases of RBG, I Am Not Your Negro, and John Lewis, Good Trouble. Hey guys, thanks so much for having me. Darian Michelle Gibson, is the executive director of SAG Indie. She is an advisor for independent film production, a COVID-19 consultant, and is a frequent participant for diversity and inclusivity panels and programs. Hello, so glad to be joining you. Nina Shaw is a founding partner of the entertainment law firm of Dale Shaw Moonvies Tanaka Finkelstein and Lescano, specializing in television, motion picture, and live stage. Most recently, she was featured in Harper's Bazaar, August 2020 issue, among change makers 
who are reshaping the way we think about art, identity, and progress. Nina has a longstanding commitment to the education of children, and in particular, is an advocate for the education of girls and women, including being one of the founding organizers of Time's Up. Well, thank you for that introduction. Good to be here. I would like to introduce my moderator, Nate Cohen. He is the director of Ebert Fest Film Festival and also a professor of cinema at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Nate Cohen. Uh, thanks, Jazz. Uh, welcome to the third annual Ebert Symposium, this year happening in a virtual space. New challenges are facing every facet of the entertainment community. We thought we'd examine these challenges from two points of view today, filmmakers and industry executives. And we've invited a few of each to be with us. We hope to benefit from their expertise, to better understand what the future holds for those of us who love movies, movie theaters, film festivals, and the profoundly social act of watching movies together in a common space. Where are we now and where do we go from here? That's a rather general question. Uh, why don't we start with, uh, with Michael and then feel uh. free to uh, <laughs> The rest of the panelists, feel free to jump in uh, and uh, let's get a conversation going about this general topic. I can't believe you're starting with me. Where are we now and where are we going? Hmm. You know, I've actually spent a lot of time in the last like, six months reading a lot about the history of the movies, but also the history of America. And what's interesting is, is about how certain things have not changed at all, shockingly. Um, after reading more of James Baldwin, I'm discovering how prescient it is, everything he wrote and said. But also, what's so, uh, what you learn and what you're inspired by from history is is our ability to adapt and to adapt to change especially the history of the motion picture business and i think the independent film business has always been challenging and it's always been difficult to adapt and and the overall motion picture business has had to adapt to many changes over time and here we are at a moment where these changes are pretty seismic because basically we're in the depths of that transition period and what the new normal is going to be we're really not sure what that is uh i tend to have a lot of faith in the future i uh, when uh when Regal made that announcement yesterday and today, I, I understand where that announcement comes from. It comes from not only uncertainty in major cities like New York and LA and in America of, of what's going on with this pandemic and uh, the rises in cases and so forth, but also if these big theater chains, if theater chains are to survive, they have to, a combination they have to they have to have a need of getting an audience in there in one case but they also need to be able to have major motion pictures and i i believe regal made that decision i heard uh, mookie speak on television today because both of those things were not happening quickly enough uh major uh, motion pictures were being withdrawn and pushed back and the audience is getting harder and harder to get in there and and the exhibition chains have the challenge of making those theaters as safe as possible. So my feeling is that will change as the situation uh, changes. But to me, it's all about adaptation and adaptation to change. And what's also very promising to me is 
uh, a lot of movies are still being made. And we still have a lot of movies that were made that haven't had the opportunity to be seen yet that are quite strong. And uh, this whole idea of, of working towards to get past this election, to get uh, past that moment when some sort of credible uh, a vaccine is created is, is going to then tell us what the new normal is going to be. Melissa, you, your movie, Mr. Soul, uh, is a, a, an independent uh, a documentary. How has that affected, how have events affected the exhibition of your film? How are you reaching your audiences? And what are, what are you doing now with the film? Thank you so much, Chaz, for asking that question, because this is really what is so encouraging right now is this model that we've created and we didn't know whether it would work so it was we were really going out on a limb but it came from the impetus behind releasing the film virtually was that we wanted to do something that was impactful we wanted to look back at this time and not ask ourselves how did you feel how did you get through it but really what did you do how, what did you do and how did you contribute you know, were you a laptop activist? Were you out in the streets? Were you um, pushing against all these structures that need to be broken down? Or, you know, how were you creating art? And we realized we had this film that had been finished and we didn't have a distributor for it, but we knew that it was a film that speaks to this moment, that it's a film called Mr. Soul. It's about the first Black Tonight show, but it's also the story of a people and a movement and a movement at a time that was very much about pushing back and a revolution, if you will. So we wanted to release this film in a way that people could enjoy and be inspired by and be uplifted, especially people of color uh, during these uncertain times, very challenging times. And so we decided to create a model where we were engaging independent cinemas art house cinemas, film institutions, film organizations, cultural institutions, museums, all the places where you would hopefully be able to show Mr. Soul or screen Mr. Soul if we uh, weren't having a pandemic. But we still wanted to bring it to the people and we wanted to give everyone agency. We also wanted to support these organizations. So the model we came up with was a virtual release and with all of these screening partners and each, par each partner, each theater or each festival or each um, museum became a miniature screening hub, like a mini streaming hub. And that's how we did it. So we partnered, we started with three and then it suddenly uh, moved to 57. And by the time we opened on our official day, we were at over 90 theaters across the nation virtually so that people could watch the film and be safe, but they could also support the, the theater that they wanted to maybe the theater down the street or their favorite cinema. They could click on that cinema and know that 50% of their purchase was supporting that theater that didn't have its brick and mortar uh, doors open. And then the other was supporting independent filmmakers such as myself. And that's, that was a completely different model, but I'm excited to say that we were able to bring the film to the public and we are now going into our second month of streaming. And it's been very encouraging and I think we did it just at the right time. We didn't want to exploit the situation, but we wanted to find something that was meaningful and uplifting and beautiful that celebrated Black lives at a time when this is an issue. Following up on Melissa's thoughts, we uh, had a film that we finished just in time. We were to open at South by Southwest. There was all kinds of buzz. We heard tickets were going like wildfire. And then of course, COVID hit. And we had, um, we're a little bit unusual um, in that very few docks really open in multiplexes. And we've had a long-term relationship with AMC. Uh, and so we pivoted with AMC and the plan was to release in March. And then we pivoted again, pivoted again. And um, what became clear certainly was the message of A Most Beautiful Thing, which chronicles the first uh, African-American high school boys rowing team from the west side of Chicago. So the most privileged sport on the planet. Um, and the story that these young men tell, it's just, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. 
And so we were faced with, do we wait? Do we keep pivoting? Do we, do we postpone into next year? And um, certainly COVID laid bare the disparities, right? Profound health disparities in our film deals with trauma in many ways. And so we began um, having conversations with our distributors way earlier than we, ex we expected to be. Uh, our first stop was um, Comcast, NBC, Universal, Peacock. And our second stop was Amazon. And so we accelerated those plans. We just, we kind of hung on there. You know, we really hung in there with AMC until it became clear that July 31, you know, Comcast was like, okay, let's get up and ready and we'll be on Xfinity as like a plan B. And then we'll launch onto Peacock at, our, you know, this particular date. And, um, and the film is just really hitting its stride in just crazy ways that, um, you know, as Melissa said, the, the story would have been relevant any time it came out, but certainly with the events over the past six months and the reaction that it's um, having in real time in terms of certainly for those that live in the world of privilege, uh, being able to connect the dots of what's happened over the past six months for, um, for the young men in the film. And, and Chaz, you're an executive producer, so you've been uh, amazing and along for this ride. I can't even begin to tell you how nimble, right, and adaptable as Melissa is, that we sort of, we just had to shift and adapt. And we're doing, we saw, people are sending me screenings from, you know, bed sheets hung outside and the, you know, like, you know, for neighborhoods to get together, there were drive-in screenings, things are popping up. Um, and meanwhile, we have sort of the more traditional distributors. And so, I think the resonance of the of the story at the time meant that um, you know we certainly had more than our fair share of press, and we've been um, kind of besieged with opportunities around adapting the screenplay, um, uh, the uh, the documentary into a feature film. So for us, COVID really opened up. I think um, uh, a new awakening, certainly coupled with the murder of George Floyd. Uh, where simply the message of the film was able to speak to the time. And so, uh, you know, sometimes luck meets opportunity, meets um, an opportunity to elevate voices that are typically underrepresented, as, as Melissa is doing and as um, the protagonists in our story are doing. Going off of what uh, our last two speakers talked about, uh, yeah. Magnolia releases a lot of films through art house cinemas. We do. What is the state of the art house cinema and what's the future of it? How do you see that? I think the state of art house cinema is not great right now, but the future is. Um, you know, I think that as distributors, we're trying to do everything we can to help, to help our art house partners. You know, like Melissa's experience with virtual cinema, that's one way. Um, we've been providing films for them to offer to their, to their patrons during this whole experience. Um, the other is holding some films until they reopen. Um, the, other, the, the, the other is just, I think, really just doing everything we can do to make sure that their audiences come back um, when, when the theaters come back. Uh, unfortunately, I think that the, the those audiences might be the, the last to come back because you know they tend to be older and um, and I, I think that they're higher risk and I, I ultimately I, I feel like um, you know they might be the slower the slower ones to come back but um, but it's it's all of our responsibilities to make sure that that does happen um, and that means keep buying the films that they want to see and uh, and putting them in in theaters. Uh, and so we pushed a lot of our films to next spring, uh, as I'm sure, you know, I, I, Michael has, has done as well, uh, because we, we want to serve those audiences. Um, you know, in the meantime, what we've been doing this summer, um, like, like Melissa's experience, you know, we started with virtual cinema in the spring and you know in March and April, uh, but we really didn't kind of hit our stride with it until uh, until Don Porter's documentary on John Lewis came out in July, uh, which we were involved in from pre-production. I mean, we 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 heard that that Don was making this film with John Lewis, and 
uh, there was no way that we were not going to release that film. So, um, you know, we opened it on July 3rd. In, in Can advance, I ask you, did, did Congressman Lewis get a chance to see that film yeah. before he passed away? Yeah, he loved it. He loved it. Don, uh, Don, Don went down and showed it to him at his home uh, and uh, in Atlanta, and they watched it together, and he, li he liked it very much. He was very happy with it. Uh, you know, that film opened July 3rd. We had initially planned a May 1st opening theatrical. I mean, for, for me, I wanted that movie to play theatrically. I mean, that was always our intent. We were going to open it in, in New York, LA, and Atlanta, and then, uh, and then take it out throughout the country in May. Um, and we, of course, had to, to pivot away from that. And um, we, wanted to, we wanted to get it out before the elections. Um, and we felt it was important to do it over the summer. And so we picked the July 4th weekend kind of as, a, as an honor to, uh, to, to Representative Lewis. Um, but, you know, virtual cinema had been for us mostly just um, theaters and arts institutions and a couple of, uh, a couple of, of nonprofits that we had worked with on, on a different uh, documentary earlier uh, in, in, the, in the spring. But with, with with the John Lewis film, we really kind of maneuvered our outreach to uh, to much larger national organizations like the NAACP, uh, Color of Change, um, the UNCF. There were dozens of organizations that came on board as virtual cinema partners, and I mean, it's a really simple rev share agreement. I, it's not there's there's no there's no real uh, uh, effort on their part except for the marketing. And, uh, and for us, it was a way to really reach the people that would most be touched by Representative Lewis's story. And then, of course, um, the congressman passed away on July 17th. Um, uh, and it was, it, was, uh, it was a surprise to us. Uh, we, we knew he was sick, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't know it was coming. Um, and of course, we then had to deal with uh, the, the massive interest in the film. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty amazing, um, both the outpouring of, uh, of, of support for him, but also, you know, you have hundreds and hundreds of groups and organizations that wanted to see the film uh, immediately. And they could, because the film was on a virtual, a virtual release. Uh, you know, they could, they could watch it on iTunes or, or any other of the VOD platforms, but they could also support the NAACP. They could support UNCF. They could support their houses of worship. Uh, and so we were able to expand this concept uh, to anybody that really wanted to, that really wanted to host a screening of the film. So, um, you know, we had, uh, we had 100 or 200 houses of worship sign up uh, all over the country. And it, it was just, it was a way for them to have this communal movie going experience without being together. I mean, it's not ideal, it's not perfect. I'm sure that, uh, that they would have preferred to go see the film together at the, you know, at the Regal Tara in downtown Atlanta. And, uh, but this was, this was the, the next best thing, I guess. And, um, and so it was, you know, it was a really, it was an interesting summer because we learned a lot about what we could do. We learned a lot about what we couldn't do with the limitations. Um, and, but I, I really think that we were in a position that enabled us to really get the film out to, to everybody that wanted to see it at the time. Uh, and it, you know, the, the process was, you know, even more democratized by that by that mass availability. Um, we also had developed this program to kind of replace the concept of theater buyouts, which is something that, you know, distributors we really like to, to pack them in opening weekend to, uh, to boost our per screen averages and to really to start building word of mouth. Um, and, you know, we encourage people to buy out screenings, uh, organizations, groups. Um, as a way to kind of replace that concept, we, uh, we offered uh, this program of online private screenings to companies uh, to provide to their employees for various diversity and, inclu and inclusion initiatives that they were doing. So we had Citibank and Nike and Target, um, you know, show the film to, to thousands of their employees. 
which was really a really cool, successful program. Um, and uh, it was uh, it was just it just it also just felt it felt nice to be able to do something to honor the representative. Um, I, you know, I didn't get to meet him, but uh, but obviously it's his, his work affected so many people. But something you said reminds me of a question for Malcolm. And Malcolm, welcome. I've seen your movies usually with a crowd, a big crowd, and we're laughing. You know, whether it's Undercover Brother, Best Man, Girl Trip. And I'm just wondering, tell me how, what, what, what's the next Malcolm D. Lee movie? And how are we going to see it? And how do you, what, what do you see for the future for your movies now? Um, it's interesting. I, I, I thank you for saying it. I'm, thank you for coming to see the movies. I uh, appreciate that. I appreciate your, your, your patronage and your dollars. Um, you know, and your laughter. Uh, you know, the thing about it is, I, I, listen, I, 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 think, I think Michael, you know, spoke on it earlier. Movie going is, 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 a, is, a, is a communal experience and we all want that again. We all want to do all kinds of things with, you know, going to dinner and holding hands and hugging people and, you know, and, and going to a movie with, you know, our friends, our family, our kids um, and having a shared, you know, experience of whether you're going to be laughing or booing or, or holding each other because you're frightened. Um, though, you know, comedies, horrors, you know, musicals, uh, uh, big spectacle movies, sci-fi. That's something we want to have happen. It's very difficult to do right now. People are very gun shy, um, and obviously the you know the studios are um, by by you know by holding things back. You know um, I don't even know how like a movie like Tenant is doing right now uh, worldwide, but I would imagine like it's a struggle um, to get people to go into the into the movie theater again. Um, you know how do they get back? When are we going to get back in the water again after Jaws? Right, like it's the same kind of thing, right? Um, I think for, for me, you know, I'm, I, I was fortunate to have, uh, uh, I'm working on, on the next iteration of Space Jam with, uh, with LeBron James. And, and we are, you know, we shot last summer, which is summer of 2019. And we are scheduled to come out, we've always been scheduled to come out in, in, in the summer of 2021. The, the conventional wisdom as of, you know, four months ago was like, things will be back to normal, people are going to movies again. I don't know, right? You know, we, we, we don't know if that's going to happen or not. We, we hope that it happens. We hope that there's, um, you know, a vaccine. We hope that there are people who feel, feel good enough and safe enough to go to the theater without restriction, um, you know, that the theaters are, you know, <laughs> have some kind of ventilation system, what have you, you know? Um, so I think what, what the pandemic has demonstrated well, for the studios and distributors is that, you know, well, what are we going to consider a theatrical release now? You know, things that have been made, things that, are, that, were, that were made, went straight to VOD, right? And they're going to, you know, make an assessment about, okay, how much distribution fees are we going to, going to pay uh, right now? How much is it worth it to, for us to, you know, exhibit this movie in a theater? besides getting it into, um, you know, right to the, to the consumer, you know, um, and that has pro it's been proven that, you know, they can make money like that. Um, now, there, there, I think that, you know, does, the, does, does a movie like Space Jam or the next big Marvel blockbuster or the next big Star Wars movie or the next big comedy, which, you know, has been difficult to get people to go out and see comedies, you know, because they're getting, they're getting stuff on their, you know, on their phones and YouTube or whatever, right? They get their, their comedy fix like that, but, but people still want to have, or the next big horror movie, right? When is, what's going to constitute people coming back to the theater? It's got to feel like an event, but are people going to be ready for that event when the time comes? I, and I, I don't think we can, we can really say right now, we can project, we can have all kinds of positive um, feelings and, and thoughts about that. I hope that that happens because there's nothing like that experience of watching a movie on a Friday night, on a Saturday, you know, matinee with your, with your date, with your family, with your kids, you know, to, you know, in, 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 in a movie experience. And then talk about that, you know, on Twitter or Facebook or, you know, on your, on, you know, the water, 
don't know if people are drinking about a water cooler nowadays, but you know, and I, I hope that, you know, things even out by that time. And again, whether there's a vaccine that vaccine that is available and then whether people are taking it, you know, and people feel safe enough. That's, that's the main thing. We got to be safety first, right? Like, and I hope that, that that's, that's what, you know, people, people think, because obviously we all want the, you know, people to come back to the, to the, to the movie theater. I can say that I, I did, I confess, I, I wrote a column about it. I did go out to a movie theater um, to see Inception, um, Chris Nolan's movie. It, it, they they re-released it at the Music Box Theater in Chicago. And the reason I went is because they talked about all of the safety protocols, all of the distancing, taking your temperature before you're going in, having you sign something that you haven't had any symptoms. But the most important thing they said is they reworked their ventilation system. They redid their entire ventilation system so that the inner air was not circulating in the theater. They were circulating air from the outside into the theater and back out. And that made me feel safe enough and a theater that holds about 700 people had only about maybe, when I went, because I went, I chose a, a very specific time mm -hmm. and there were maybe only about 10 or 20 of us there, very spaced out. How can you, the economics don't work, but I felt safe because of the ventilation and the safety protocols they were taking. Now, when I was watching a movie like Christine Swanson's The Clark Sisters, I was very happy that I could watch it on a platform, that I could watch it at home. I called my nieces and we all got together to talk about it, to talk about because I love the singing. And Christine, I want you to tell us uh, what, is, what was your experience with the Clark sisters and what, are you, what, is, what do you see as the future of the type of movies that you make and how you exhibit them? The Clark sisters were supposed to air um, before the pandemic and um, it was supposed to come out with the premiere and all the hoopla that typically accompanies uh, a release of a film, even for a, a television network. But um, it eventually came out during the pandemic. And here's one or two observations that, that, that we, we, we made. Um, on, on some levels, it was a bigger hit then, then maybe it could have been because it was a pandemic and everybody and their mama was home to watch the movie. And then what, um, and, and my whole approach with the movie was this, uh, I'm, I'm an independent filmmaker and I work within the studio system. And um, even though it was to air on a network like Lifetime, the goal was to not make it look like a Lifetime movie and make it feel and look like a regular feature film. And I think that enhanced the um, experience of watching it as well as well for the for the viewers and um so what we started to discover as the movie rolled out it, when it aired on the night that it came it smashed records um everyone was at home and and the people who were curious about the clark sisters they were going to tune in but the interesting phenomenon of this particular film was um people started to watch it two three four, five, 10, 20, 30 times. And then they would tell their friends. So it went from a viewership of 3 million and it swelled to 14 million people within the span wow. of 10 days, which, yeah. which, which told, me one, it told me one thing in particular, that there is an audience that is hungry for content that centers around black women and that is told in, a, in an event type of, it, of an experience. So when we did the numbers, uh, for that type of audience viewing, um, if it came out theatrically, it would have grossed. Well, I showed you that black audience, black women driven audience that will show up, pay money, see it over and over and over again, tell their friends. And this is how we knew we were a success. Um, this is when you know you hit, you hit jackpot. It was bootlegged. Um, over 200,000 times on YouTube. Oh, no. <laughs> so you, you know you make it as a filmmaker once people start bootlegging your work. So I say all that to say um, there, it, it's, it's, it's a promising environment 
for content that centers on and for Black women. And it always has been. And, and that's the space that I'm always going to champion because I really think there's a lot to, 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 to uncover there. And um, rolling out in a pandemic proved that even within a pandemic, this particular type of storytelling and model was successful and will forever be successful. So, and, and so I think there will always be an audience um, in theaters too. So my hope for what happens with theaters is this, um, because I have teenage kids, I know as soon as the pandemic ends, they are gonna go out to the movie theaters and watch movies. So that cannot die. So we really need to, as a film industry, um, get um, help for our theaters um, from our government to bail them out, just like they bail out the auto industry. And because the we, create, industry and, yeah. we create a content that is one of the number one exports out of this country. So we have to save it and preserve it, and it will come back and make money over and over and over again. You're completely yeah. right. They need it. The, the, the government needs to, to jump in and, yeah. and help out exhibition. Because, look, studios, uh, studios can move their product. They can move it to whenever they want. They can move Bond to April. They can move Dune to October of 2021. They can do whatever they need to do, and their, their profits probably won't change that much. Movie theaters, and this is, Nate, coming back to your question about art houses, they're in a position where they have to outfit all their HVAC with new, with new filters. They have to outfit all of their concession stands with plexiglass, with all kinds of safety protocols, with hand wash stations, with sanitizing stations. They have to do all that work. We, we, don't, we don't have to do it. The exhibitors are on the hook for that, that, those upgrades. And they, they can't do it. They haven't, they haven't sold tickets in six months. And so, and so they need, they need government assistance. Like, and you know, this government, you know, they don't assist a lot of people. So, you know, I, I, I really hope that things change and that, and that big help comes to exhibition because, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it, they, they, they really do need it. And the same thing happened the same thing happened 10 years ago, eight years ago, when theaters were transitioning from 35 millimeter to, DC, to DCP. You know, that was, that was a huge cost that exhibition had to shoulder the majority of. Uh, and, uh, you know, and unlike a 35 millimeter projector, which you could have the same one for 70 years and only have to change it and change the bulb every once in a while, you know, these, these, these DCP uh, systems are computers. They have to be upgraded all the time. And so mm -hmm. exhibitors have a ton of costs and they need, they need the help. Um, you know, they need it. So. In the first, in the first CARES bill, were, were theaters included? No, I, mean, I don't think were. so. I mean, our, our local art house soon they got, I think, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oh. Uh, yeah, sort of they off. were covered. They were covered, but they weren't covered in the way of in anything unique to them or us as an industry. They were covered like any other business and held to the standards of the PPP guidelines. So, you know, if you could keep your business running, in fact, there was a theater. I think it was in Northern California where they opened it. Uh, every afternoon and sold popcorn outside for twenty dollars, and the notion was that you were buying this popcorn as a way to subsidize the theater, and they kept their employees hired on engaged in that way. But also, you know, just to address something that both Malcolm and Christine hit upon is that. Um, you know, as, as disruptive as the streaming model has been to our business, and I know this is an especially sensitive topic in this particular group of people, it did prepare audiences for the at-home movie experience in a way that perhaps they might not have been prepared for pre-streaming world. You know, the notion of watching That's a, a feature-length film at home is something that an audience was open to. Um, Neil, I can tell you that we have Friday night movie night at my house, and we patronize local independent theaters. And we, so we saw both um, the John Lewis film as well as Fight, your ACLU uh, film, on those Friday nights. But we pick a cinema, we pick a company, and we watch and we consider it our movie night as if we were going out to the movies. 
Wow. Um, and I don't know if that's something we would have thought about in the same way if we hadn't experienced movies at home in a way that, you know, some, kind of the larger format televisions allow you to have not the same experience and not a communal experience, but an experience that feels like a little something other than television. Uh, real quick, I, I, I think one thing that, that is the catch-22, one of the catch-22s about this is that, is that right now we are, we are kind of training older audiences that haven't, that haven't otherwise been adept at this kind of at-home viewing model to, to become more adept at it. And in doing so, we may be, you know, we may be harming that audience going back to theaters in the long run. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird, you know, it's a weird existential question that, that we're all kind of, you know, dealing with right now. Hard, hard to say because remember that audience also likes to go out and eat. Yeah, totally. And they like to see their friends, totally. and it's a it's a bigger social experience for them than just seeing the movies, especially because they have often the discretionary income to do so. Yeah, the at home viewing has grown over time, pandemic or no pandemic, and there's been an upside to that in that it's the same with the DVD proliferation, which caused a greater sophistication amongst a wider uh, audience. Um, the upshot of all of this is that more than ever before, we are going to have to look at every movie and see what's best for that movie in the current marketplace. Now that we're in the middle of this pandemic, it's obvious the pandemic is a factor in the decision that's made uh, for what's best for that movie, you know. Um, for example, we had a movie called Burnt Orange Heresy. It, it played one week and then the pandemic shut all the theaters down, but we decided to reopen it on August 7th. But all the different ancillaries, like uh, all the, the platforms, whether it's Apple iTunes or stores like Costco and Walmart and Redbox, all of these entities were poised in a way they wouldn't be for a movie like this so quickly on a really short window and it turned to really work out for the movie. And I think what we're going to be seeing is a lot of people that are really steadfast on the windows. There may be a little more flexibility there than there was before. And even after the pandemic, we're going to be looking at each film to see what's best for that film. I have to tell you, um, uh, there, there are certain, uh, in addition to what Malcolm was talking about, there's that type of film that, that we have uh, survived with, which is a film that requires word of mouth. It requires a distinction in a certain way that gives it a long, long tail. And the pandemic has proven that for us because so many of the titles in our library of 400 titles have really rose to, risen to the occasion during this pandemic and done uh, the kind of revenues you wouldn't normally expect for movies like these, which is a plus. But as we come out of this pandemic, you know, what's interesting is when you see these movies, people that are like us that look for movies to buy or, or launch movies in festivals, or are ready to open movies. There are some movies that are very conducive. They're shot in a kind of intimate way. They're, they're more conducive to the at-home viewing than these kind of epic movies that really lend, and I don't mean just as far as big studio films, also smaller independent films where uh, watching it on the big screen is what's required to spread the word of mouth to get it to have real traction on at the home as well. And so what I think where we are is analyzing these films, looking for like uh, uh, some of the stories we've just heard, the kind of serendipitous kind of uh, circumstances that cause you to take advantage of that which gets the most eyeballs on your movie. And so I just think there's going to be more uh, circumspection on that. And uh, people are going to be ready, I think, uh, I heard the word pivot used a lot, uh, people be ready to pivot uh, according to our new world, which seems to be new and changing every day. So Nina, how is this affecting 
uh, legal film, what are the, the legal ramifications of what's happening in, in deal making? You know, um, we could probably spend a couple of hours talking about that, but just to, to focus on a couple of things that I'm noticing, especially as we're starting to go back into production. First of all, I'm sure all of you can attest to this. The COVID related costs of production are outrageous, st staggering, yeah. just just staggering. I mean, we're talking about in some cases 25 to 33 percent of the cost of a motion picture. Wow. And so when you have a cost like that pushing against an already inflated cost of production, it has to be taken up somewhere. And where it usually gets taken up is in, you know, a salaries mm -hmm. uh, below the line are union mandated for the most part, although I know, um, Darian, you can in the indie world, that's a, a little bit more more fungible, but but certainly um, in the above the line, um, in location related costs, there's just so many costs. I'm sure Malcolm, you could give a seminar on on how these costs are really being impacted. But you know, one of the things that concerns me as someone who not only loves what I do as a lawyer but who cares about the social justice parts of it, mm -hmm. is that there are people who are only now beginning to find their footing in this business, who are only now beginning to be appreciated for what they bring to this. People who have been marginalized and out of this business in many ways, or not participating fully. And those people may not have enough of a foothold to survive this period of time. And that worries me tremendously. Um, and, 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 you know, we were moving towards actually um, a, a bit more gender equity, for example, in, in salaries. Um, you know, women who were often on the lower end of the pay scale were being recognized. And in some cases, it, is, it, it was and it still is unacceptable to pay two people who are closely aligned in terms of their history and what else differently. But, you know, where it pushes down is everyone else. So that, that's, a, that's a thing that I worry about tremendously. And then, you know, a lot of things that were traditional gets that you would get for talent are not obtainable anymore because travel restrictions. I mean, who here ever thought that we as Americans would have a problem getting into Canada? <laughs> yeah, it's true. I know. It's, it's, thank you, it's Washington. It's so true. Thank you, Trump. I'm just going to say it. I because have a new grandson born in Copenhagen in May, and I cannot go to the country to see my grandson. Right. So even though you're able to obtain oh, um, congratulations, visas, Michael. Congratulations. Thanks. Yes. So you can get a visa to get your employer, your 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 talent in. But you know those people who might have otherwise traveled with them. You know, I have a client recently who you know may be forced to quarantine in a hotel room with a toddler and a nanny oh, for yeah. 14 days <laughs> um, oh, wow. in, 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 in Australia because the rules there are so strict and we, we were only able to, to get a nanny in by, you know, literally begging, Michael, I'm sure you can appreciate this. I mean, it, it has changed a lot and I don't know if people yeah. who are not as in, intimately involved on the deal making side or on the production side, realize how big these changes are and the long term impact that they may have on our business. Nita brought up a point that I think is so important in that we have been making strides towards not having people on set just hire their friends and their buddies and the people who they hang out with all the time. But now we're in a point where when you have to have an incredibly small crew, and you can't afford to train anyone or bring someone up because time is, you know, at a, is so small and the money is so great that we're going to lose a generation of people who were going to be brought up through this business wow. and give it an opportunity. And mm -hmm. now you're going to go with the person who you've done 16 movies with because you know each other so well, and you're not going to bother bringing in other people. And so we're going to lose a lot of people that way. We're gonna lose a lot of time for people. And that's hard to sustain a career if you can't get hired anywhere because you can't build your resume. So this is a wash year for those people, some of whom are not gonna be able to wait it out. You know, you know who it's really, it's really painful for 
is I remember that day that they shut down South by Southwest. And you just yeah. think of all those filmmakers that had their first film that they were going to see on the big screen for the first time. And that's an opportunity they never may get again, you know? And, and this is a real issue with new filmmakers creating that resume, you know? And, uh, and that's why these festivals have become more important than just a kind of marginal thing. Uh, it's so important that these festivals stay alive and introduce these new filmmakers. That's why we've got to get back into theaters to show their films so they can see for the first time what it's like with an audience and have press and exhibitors and public see them. You know, Michael, maybe just as important uh, is the fact that film festivals are where filmmakers go to meet other filmmakers. Oh, yeah. That's where they build their peer group. That's where they get their resources. Who can they call? Who can they build and create and get to know? And that part has gone away yeah. in such a profound way that festivals mm -hmm. going virtual don't allow people to really meet other filmmakers. You're not going to have that moment of let's sit down, have a talk, find like-minded people. They can't do that. So there's a peer group problem now that you can't call someone and say, where'd you get your insurance? Or I it's like a, your camera. Tell me about it, that. It's a big problem for distributors too, because one of the main um, reasons can is so valuable is to hear and see what are on the minds of these filmmakers. What are the issues that are on their minds and how can that connect with what's going on with the audience at a particular moment? We've just lost all that. Yeah, and to make introductions. I can't tell you yeah. how many times I've been at a film festival and I can introduce a young client to Malcolm Lee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I can introduce someone who, you know, you know, I remember, I remember um, that I met Nia DaCosta uh, through Casey Lemons at the Sundance Film Festival because Nia was Casey's student and they were spending time together. And Nia and Casey said, I have this incredible young student who you really should meet, who I think is just gonna have a great career. And Nia is firmly on her way there. But that was a chance encounter at Sundance. Yeah, yeah the word virtual and the word festival should never be in the same sentence. Wait, I well, I don't know. I think yeah. it, for the moment, it has been helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that a lot of the filmmakers have talked about how much further their film, how much wider the audience has been for their films, so that even yeah. though they're not meeting anyone or seeing anyone, that their film is being seen around the country, around the world, and that is a, a, a tremendous thing, but they're, you know, it's a seesaw. That's great. Yeah. Other things are not so much. I would just yeah. say that, like you know, that like that, that's just that's going to be a, just another layer that we're, we're that we're that's going to help the filmmaker. You know, like like you know, the, the idea is like you know, like get you you know, you want to get the movie seen. You know, no matter what, right? And that's that's the bottom line. And even though like, you know, I came from a from an era that was like, oh yeah, film, right? Television is just as you know cinematic today as it's as, as you know as it's ever been, right? And so like whether it's on a small screen, the really small screen, you know, like that, you know, or if it's on the big screen, like, it, you know, content is king and people want to see, they want to see stuff. And it's, been, and it's vital for the filmmaker to, to, to get their story out there. Now, you know, uh, Michael talked about, okay, let's, let's, you know, there might be a, a you know, a way to, you know, to kind of like, it's going to be a judgment made about what movie gets, gets to be on, on the big screen. Right. And you as the filmmaker, you're like, I made this movie for, a 70 foot screen and yeah. they're like sorry 10 feet you know it's all you get or like you know 60 inches is all you're going to get you know and you, you know that's going to be a you know a hard pill for some people people to swallow but at the same time it's go it's going to happen you know it's already happening it's already happened this year in very big significant ways even if that has happened i still believe there's a view that the primal primary way to see a, a major motion picture is to see it on the screen. Forget about revenues for a moment. Philosophically, psychologically, maybe all the money will not come from theatrical, but the fact of the matter is that is still a primary that I don't think is going to leave or disappear.
I agree. Completely agree, agree too, but we're going to see shorter windows. These shorter yeah. windows are not going to go away. Sorry, everyone, but. <laughs> I just want to throw something out there too that nobody's mentioned, which is the, one of the great things about relationships that you build at film festivals, not just within other filmmakers, but with the film festival programmers themselves, and that you keep coming being invited back. In my case, I've, uh, we had a really robust film festival run, but it was two years ago. But I kept those relationships with a lot of the programmers. And now, you know, as COVID progressed and the summer progressed and this whole landscape started to shift around um, virtual screenings, we were able to sort of go back to some of those film festival relationships and the ones who had sort of morphed their uh, programming onto the eventive platform or the other platforms that were being used, we were able to be invited back by them to screen as part of the festival, not necessarily in the festival lineup, but because they had these platforms that were already, um, you know, working for digitally and virtually. So that was really, really helpful. For example, like we were able, we had opened the festival at Indie Memphis two years ago. Uh, Mr. Soul, and so we went back to them and said, do you guys have a platform that's happening? And they were like, yeah, come on, let's do it. And it might not be during the time of their festival specifically, but throughout the year. Same thing with like Woods Hole Film Festival, really small festival I love out on Martha's Vineyard um, on the Cape, uh, right before you go to the vineyard actually. And you know, relationships with them and they were like, well, we'd loved your film. We played it throughout the year, two years ago and we'd like to do it again. So that's something that's really key is to build these relationships and not let the fact that we are separated, you know, and to curb our enthusiasm <laughs> literally around being able to show our films and, and, and continue this relationship building. What has this time of a, you know, global pandemic, um, you know, racial and social unrest, sort of a, I, I, I hope it's going to be a renaissance of some empathy and compassion and kindness in the world because it's sorely needed. I hope it's going to be a renaissance of something about equality, gender equality and racial equality because it's surely needed. But what personally has, has it, I, just some statement about what, what it means for you this time that we're going through. Um, I, I would I would personally say this um, because of my experience of having created content that came out in a pandemic and not really sure of how that was going to play out, and then it played out in a way that in, in an astounding way. One of the things I walked away from this experience is, is this: is to be firmly grounded in in in, in voice and unapologetically so. So. To, to really uh, ground myself in my voice and the storytelling that, that connects or connected with an audience in, in a tremendous way um, where they reached back, back out to me and told me how much they needed this story in this pandemic. That really said something to me. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking we take that um, beyond the pandemic and stay grounded in, in the specific storytelling that, that I'm, I'm particularly, um, you know, crafted with in a way to reach that audience that responded tremendously to, to that type of storytelling and beyond. So just be grounded in voice and be unapologetic about it because you will reach somebody who needs to hear that voice. There's been a great awakening. Um, and I, when I mean a great awakening, I think those of us that live in the world of privilege, and I don't mean money, I mean privilege. Those of us that have been given small kindnesses throughout our life, small kindnesses, advancements, boosts that simply wouldn't have happened but for the color of our skin. I think those of us that live in the world uh, need to do more. Um, and certainly as I think about the work that we do at my company, which is really around social impact, it's frankly what what more can we do and how can we inspire others um, to sort of, you know, step in the mile of another's voice. And Christine said it so beautifully about sort of the power of voice. And for me, it is how, how do I help amplify 
voices that are typically underrepresented and it's their voice, their story, not their voice according to me, not my version of their voice. And, and again, I think it comes back to certainly um, for me, what more can I do both from a filmmaking standpoint, but also from an advocacy standpoint. Um, and I know I, you know, I've thought about this a lot this year and, um, and can do more. I, 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 I want to kind of echo um, what Mary's saying. I mean, I, what, what I find encouraging and I find, you know, kind of just different than, than things have been um, is an awareness of white privilege and awareness of um, systemic racism um, in, in, in nowhere at no time that in our history did the, the murder of George Floyd galvanize a country and a movement um, because of high unemployment, this pandemic, and people being shuttered and sheltered in where they were just like, you know, I, I'm going to get out I'm gonna, I'm, and I'm going I'm to look at this thing and, 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 and see the humanity in this man in a way that, that, that hasn't been, you know, exhibited before, you know? Um, so I think that that's gonna, it, is, it has permeated and will permeate, I hope, you know, in that, that it's, it's, it's I don't know, and you're seeing it now, and you've been seeing it over the summer with just how many advocates, as Mary said, that are out there, that are, that are, that are you know, that are not seeing George Floyd as a black man, but as a human being. And, I, and, and throughout my career, that's always been my, my goal when it comes to displaying stories about African-American characters and their humanity and their Americanness. Um, and so I hope that, you know, people will, will be more open. I think they are to seeing stories and wanting to see stories that are inclusive um, of other people and universal at the same time. Wow, that was great, Malcolm. That's so beautiful. I echo all the sentiments of the filmmakers who just spoke, and especially because this is, we are on the eve of a great racial reckoning, and this is a moment, it's an inflection point, but it's also a moment when we can recognize as artists what our role is or what our roles are and how we, we have to remember that creativity is part of the cultural shift has always moved people and that we can do our part in that way and that art can't be canceled i mean this whole year is, is canceled everything's canceled but art and love and truth and humanity can never be canceled that's really what i'm taking from this moment that uh you know black joy is revolutionary black love is revolutionary I'm not just saying that because I'm black, but I'm, I'm recognizing that this is a truth that everyone can see now. There's, 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 there's been, you know, almost like an opening happening. And if we can see it that way, then perhaps we can move toward, uh, you know, greater uh, a meritocracy in so many different ways. I think all of us work very hard at that. And I know specifically my work reflects you know, critically on these pressing social issues and about at the intersection of racial justice and social justice, representation, but it always has. So it's just interesting to me that right now there's a reinvigoration uh, around uh, stories like ours that, that really matter, the idea that all stories matter, but they have to be grounded in truth. And moving the culture forward is really what we have to do. We really have to start over in a way. And so I'm just very excited about being able to amplify the voices of women, especially, and people of color, and that, that this is a moment where we can make change. We can be just as revolutionary as, say, my uncle was in 1968 with the Soul Show, what he was trying to do and, and you know, making a, a, paving the way for so many, because we all stand on the shoulders of giants in many ways. Everyone on this, on this panel, and Chaz, especially you and Roger Ebert and everyone who's made this, this moment possible. And so if we can stay encouraged that way and really see how far we've come, but yet recognize how far we have yet let to go, as artists, we can be a part of that change. I feel such anxiety almost every day 
but when I hear the filmmakers that we have just heard speak and what they said, I feel a lot of confidence and I feel touched and I, I let's keep listening to them. Darian? Well, you know, personally, this time is kind of solidified for me. Um, something that I've has always been there in that, you know, when I work at SAG Indy, where our, my job is to try to help people, but it really kind of solidified that we all can do something more to help our industry and our people and our, and our world. And that it doesn't have to be me trying to change the world at large, but I can take something on. And it's uh, issues that I've been thinking of a lot lately. Like the fact that 3% of all casting directors in the CSA are people of any color, 3% mm. or less. Um, the amount of uh, composers of color who are getting hired, um, those are things that I just look at and I go, how are we gonna fix that? What can we do? And so it really gave me time to sit back and say, okay, I'm gonna figure out a program for this. I'm gonna figure out a way to introduce this information. And so it's, it's invigorated me to look at how I can fix my corner and, and think that other people will also join in in trying to fix at least this first corner. Then we'll move on to another corner, but I can do something. And that has really given me time to sit and go, what am I gonna do to help this? Well, you know, along the lines of what Darian had to say, um, my partners and I as small business owners, and granted we have been far more fortunate than many other small business owners in America and that we have been able to maintain our business. Um, but sometimes when you're in the position we're in, a, in a business that was started um, by majority people of color, uh, you may not realize how much more work you have to do. So we've used this period of time to really bring in people uh, to speak to our employees, to talk about these tough issues that were never really discussed in the workplace. And that in and of itself has been a, a blessing. And it has also given us um, uh, an ability to really show empathy, to be empathetic about our working parents in this business. Uh, to be empathetic for those people who are caring for others who find themselves highly at risk at this time. So, and also, you know, to give them some insight into why we as the partners and other attorneys in this business do what we do and why we are so passionate about it because law, is, as you all know, is a profession where you can do a lot of different things. But when you choose to do so, do this, you do this because you really do love the art. Um, and you want to be there for artists. So I think this is, we've been able to expand the mission of our business in a way that, that might feel small, but in the end, I hope has larger ramifications. You know, one of the reasons that I've, I've been at Magnolia, I've, I've been there for 15 years, is because, um, is because we so often acquire and release and distribute movies by and about women and people of color and um uh you know from who streets to i'm not your negro and uh tony morrison documentary and john lewis and i mean it's really uh, there aren't a lot of other distributors who, who who have released that that kind of breadth of, of of film over the years and um you know i've never worked harder in my career uh, than I did on the John Lewis film this summer. I mean, part of that was because we were faced with this new pandemic reality of how to release a movie during this. And we didn't know what the hell we were doing. I, it was like, you know, we had to kind of figure it out as we were, as we were releasing this film. And then, uh, you know, and, and then with his passing, it, it just became this, this whole crazy experience. Um, but in the lead up to that, uh, we were, we were just laser focused on this film and, uh, and wanting to be able to share it with as many people as possible. And in, in releasing that movie, we, I personally, and we as a company have learned, I think, new ways of reaching audiences that might not often be successfully reached by independent film distributors, you know? Um, so we hope, my hope is that, uh, that all the lessons that we've learned from this 
summer and that film specifically, but, uh, but all the other films that, that, that we've worked on um, are translatable to once we're back in theaters, um, you know, which I do think is going to happen, um, uh, hopefully soon, but w whenever it does happen, uh, I, I'd like to think that uh, the, the, the connections that we've made uh, with audiences and the connections that we've made with organizations uh, that promote uh, the, the, the work of, uh, that John Lewis was doing and uh, we, we wouldn't have been able to work with those groups and those people had it not been for, I think, really for the pandemic. Uh, it, it kind of forced mm -hmm. us to think a new way about releasing films. And, uh, and for me, being able to, to take all those lessons and, and keep applying them to future films, um, and especially the kind of films that Magnolia likes to release, um, you know, I feel, I feel really optimistic about, about it. Uh, and I, you know, of course, I feel honored to have worked on that film and um, and and all these other movies that that we've that we've released over the years. What what I've learned through this is that uh, the routines of our lives need to be changed. And we, I, I talk to film students every day, and right now they're very very worried about what the future holds for them. And having listened to this panel this evening. Um, the message I'm gonna take back to them is one of hope, one of positivity, that the future is bright and it's gonna get uh, even brighter for those who've been left out up until now. So we, I, I really thank you all for this uh, really invigorating discussion. And I thank you too. And I want you to know that it's, um, there are, uh, it's a, it's a big panel, there are a lot of you, and we wanted you each to be able to express things, but we didn't want to cut down the panel because you were all specifically chosen to be on the Ebert Symposium. It's named for my late husband, Roger Ebert. He thought that empathy was one of the essential qualities of civilization and he felt that movies generated empathy and that one of the most noble things that movies could do, good films, is to help people live in the shoes and in the hearts and minds of another person. Today, this world, 2020, is really a time when we really need empathy. And each one of you has either made a film or represented clientele or exhibited films that to me have some of the biggest hearts, the biggest empathy, compassion, kindness, all of these principles that are so important. So to me, the panel, we're talking about the industry which also is economics, but to me, it's really humanity as well. Mm -hmm. And I thank each one of you for taking out the time to be with us today. And, you know, I just wish you Godspeed. Jazz. It's been Thank you, really Jazz. great. Thank you, Jazz. Thanks for putting this together. It's been really, really great. Appreciate it.